Hello, everyone. Um, again, thank you, Maria, for that lovely introduction. Um, I have to say it is an honor to join all of you all, wherever you are. Uh, it is an honor to share this space with you. And just like what Maria had said, I have to say that um, my journey as, a, as an activist, as someone who wanted to use um, you know, the privileges and the platform that I've been given, really, um, I could look back, it's, it's like a full circle moment here for me. I was, um, I was the Commission of Status of Women in 2013. And being in that space with everyone um, sharing their stories, but most importantly, you know, as someone who was born and raised in the Philippines and to be in that space, meaning Angie Umbak, um, you know, a, a, an activist from the Philippines, and to be in that space where uh, knowing that, th that this are the, the group of community and family that, that I will be joining, it was an incredible honor. Since 2014, I, you know, in this moment of reflection, I can't I can't help but think of, of that particular moment. As someone, as I've mentioned, born and raised in the Philippines, moving to United States with a dream of wanting to be a model in a place where, you know, being born and raised in the Philippines with, in a country that, um, that have always had visibility for trans uh, women specifically in our transgender pageant, but we didn't have any political recognition and, and we're still fighting for our um, uh, full political recognition and to move to United States and all of a sudden to live this life almost like it was a, a, a dichotomy of moving to California where there was a degree of political recognition where I could change my name and gender marker on my legal documents but then there was no cultural visibility. It was a paradox in my experience. So moving to New York City and wanting to pursue my modeling career, I, it presented a different challenge. For close to eight years, I was in the closet. My model agent did not know, the industry did not know about my trans story. And I certainly recognize the degree of privilege in that. But at some point after living that life for close to eight years, it did a tremendous, um, um, in a way, um, emotional turmoil that I've experienced of I'm in this industry that was all about the power of imagery, but I was not being seen as my authentic, proud trans woman. 2014 changed that whole uh, moment of that. And what when I did that TED Talk, when I decided that if I'm going to take the, 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 the control of my narrative, and to speak at TED, I wanted it to be big. I wanted to. I wanted it to mean something. So, in in conversations with Outright and so many different um, activists all over the world, I wanted to launch Gender Proud as an advocacy advocating for um, starting with gender recognition policies, trans rights in general. I was. It's, it was a privilege to travel the world and meet so many of my trans and gender non-conforming siblings, the indigenous folks, the indigenous communities that, that have been doing the work. Um, at some point I, I realized, what does it mean now, as, as I mentioned, as someone who have lived half of my life in the Philippines and half of my life in the United States, to all of a sudden travel the world and speak about issues, uh, about my personal story, about the trans community, there's always this notion for myself as well, like what does it mean to be seen as someone with this, in a way, Western ideals, but still with that lived experience of someone from the global South? I, I posted that question for myself because I, I think that's, that's in a way that some of those biggest, bigger questions that I ask for myself. Um, I, I wanna present that very uh, nuanced point of view. Um, but then I think most importantly, as I travel the world and, and, and work with different folks is that I realize the most important thing is to go back to my lived experience, but most importantly, to decolonize my mindset. As a Philippines, a country that's been colonized multiple times over, I realized that I am standing in the shoulders of, of giants to the trans women that have been, you know, leading the way in the community, whether it's whether it's trap, whether it's Ganda Pilipinas, whether it's uh, TLF Share, the, the, the activist groups that's been doing the work uh, way before. And but most importantly, the historical context of the pre-colonized culture in the Philippines, the Babaylan, the, the spiritual leaders that are revered, not just then, but also now. I want to inhabit that spirit of 
what does it mean now for me as an out and proud transgender decolonized immigrant Filipina living in United States? Certainly 2020, it's been, can't underestimate the, the, the tragic uh, realities that we're dealing with right now. I can't help but look back at the beginning of 2020 when I was asked to be the national chair for, the, for this year's Stonewall Day. We, 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 present, we presented this dilemma of how, how, do we, how, how do we use our platforms to help uh, the most marginalized in our community. And as a national chair, I wanted to emphasize that we wanted to start first by helping trans uh, black and brown trans-led organizations, and we're happy to have had, you know, raised, you know, close to 100,000 for these organizations. Um, around June, there was a particular moment when the uprisings was happening, and then a few weeks before uh, the June Pride celebration, June Pride uh, here in the United States, there were the the onslaught of of murders and violence that the trans community was experiencing. And then the Supreme Court decisions about the employment uh, non-discrimination protections that includes uh, trans and gender and not, not gender identity protections. But then the day after the, another murder of, of, of a, a black uh, trans woman, it's that kind of trauma that I personally myself, you know, felt that I've never experienced in, in, in that intensity as we all are experiencing in, in, in this moment. But I want to say that in that moment, only revitalize that, that need why we need to be there for each other. Why in this moment and what we now know that as marginalized community that we've always known, that the systems in place have, it's very vulnerable. The systems in place that we're always fighting for, for a more inclusive and just um, world where equity and, and the voices of the most marginalized are centered. These are the things that we've we've known for so long. I've been telling people, and this is why now more than ever, um, dismantling white supremacist gender binary systems that's been in place must be dismantled completely right away as soon as possible. But in reality, this is a this is a long game, right? As I've mentioned, this is uh, this is a moment where. I realized that uh, people has been doing the, doing this work for for so long more than me, and obviously the new generations of our trans and LGBT um, youth that that are doing the work uh, needs to be supported. I also can't help but in this moment where we're zooming, when we're having conversations with our community, now more than ever we have to be there for each other. I am in conversation with my. Um, trans sisters that are uh, sex workers in the Philippines that have lost their work because they're not able to travel. But also, but you know, most of my trans sisters that are, uh, most importantly, that they're providers for their family. It's that kind of resilience that I'm, I'm listening to what they're doing. I'm listening to, uh, you know, how they're surviving from moving the work, from traveling all over Southeast Asia to moving it online. I have to say, if there's one thing that 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 I carry with me as as we move forward, as we thank God the election that we that we got here in the United States is to go back to where I started. I this this year for my birthday, it was a touching moment where I was able to celebrate my my birthday fittingly in the Philippines with our Zoom uh, trans pageant lottery. And it was amazing to be there with my trans family and my siblings that I've known since I was 15 years old. And to just share that moment, to share that space, because that relationship that I've had with them since I was 15 years old, my trans mother who, who showed me the way, who saw something in me when I started joining trans pageants, is the energy that I want to bring in right now. And you know, as I continue this work, because at the end of the day, we only have each other. And that conversations that we're having, when I wake up in the morning where I share cooking pancake with my trans mother over a Facebook video is what keeps me going. And if there's one message I just want to leave with everybody is, is, is that. And that community 
you know, I'm so lucky to have had my trans siblings and family in the Philippines that I'm still in touch with today. But sometimes it just takes that one person. I had that one person, you know, when I was 15 years old that, that saw something in me, that saw a better future for me, that have nurtured and guided me. And in turn, I'm sharing this message to everyone because that's what we need to hold on to. The people that loved us, the people that wants to wants the best for us, that wants wants us to see us to see us shine. And in this moment in time, that's what we all need. And I look forward to continuing this work with all of y'all. I, I owe so much of the privileges and the space that I'm able to inhabit because of the work of the activists has been there, you know, way before I started. And I'm, I'm, I'm more inspired more than ever. So thank you so much again for, um, for giving me this space. Thank you for Maria. Thank you to just, uh, to, just to everybody at Outright. Thank you.